So before we get started, I just want to say that anybody who has prayer requests, I'm going to say a prayer and hopefully be able to lift everybody up who has those prayer requests in prayer. And also, if there's anybody who needs to you know, possibly reach out to anybody and talk or, or just talk about something, uh, me, I'm here for you. You can get my number off the Tuscan Nuba website. Uh, Casey, I know he's here for you. So if you can bow your head, we're going to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I just, God, I thank you, I thank you for everything that you do for us. God, you are all powerful and almighty, and, and we, we do understand that as a church. And God, we, 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 we lay down ourselves to you, God, for, uh, to be used for what you need. For your purpose, God, not for our purpose. And God, anybody who's out there in the community today or, or who's in our church, God, I, I pray that you keep them safe. Uh, through this, this terrible time that we're going through, God, I pray that you, you, you give healing to those who need healing. And, and God, you give comfort to those who need it. Uh, once again, God, we, we come to you understanding that you are the all-powerful and you are great. And anything that we need, God, you can provide. And all we need to do is look toward you. In your name, amen. Good evening, everybody. How are you doing? It's uh, out here at Tuscany Baptist Church, about to hopefully present you a lesson that you can enjoy. Uh, if you're like me, you're just getting off work, and that eh, stress of the stress day of the work is. Ooh, it's a killer, but being able to study and present a lesson is always helping me, and it helps me focus, and it really helps me relieve some stress of the day. So I just want to kind of talk about uh, sort of what we talked about on the Sunday, last Sunday that I preached. I get back into Samuel and just kind of recap where we were. Uh, when we first read Samuel, we went into the story of how Samuel was a young, or how Samuel was a young boy, and he had been given to the, the priesthood of... Uh, to Eli and now Eli was raising him as a young child and he even as a young child was doing the deeds of, of a priest the, the work of a priest and he was given the garments that the, the priest got at the age of 25 but he was given these garments at a younger age and that shows us how, how effective this Samuel was and how God was using Samuel even then and then we jump into more of the story where we, we see that Somebody comes to Eli and they tell him, Eli, hey, everything that you're doing, everything that your son's doing, and the fact that you're ignoring that, that's wrong. And God will, God will avenge himself. God will, will stop what you're doing. And he's going to cut your lineage off. And we also read about how, how God came to Samuel. And God called out to Samuel multiple times. And Samuel ran into Eli and, and, and told Eli, I'm here, I'm here. What do you need? And Eli's like, I don't need anything. I didn't call you. And again, once again, God calls out to Samuel and says, I'm here. I heard you. I heard you call. And Eli says, I, I didn't call you. And the third time that this happened, Eli said, hey, you need to go talk to God. You need to go ask God. Uh, you need to go tell God that you're here and you hear him and you're listening and, and that you're his servant and you are, are here to to do his bidding and do what he wants. So when we move on from that, we, we see that Samuel is now grown. And it says, And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and did let not his words fall on the ground. In all Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, knew what Samuel was established to be, to be a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel and Shiloh by the word of the Lord. So we see that Samuel is now grown. He's a, he's a, he's a grown man, and he is now established. And everybody knew in Israel, everybody knew that he was now established as a leader in Israel, as the leader in Israel. And he was the prophet of God. So we see that from a young, from a young boy that, that God has raised Samuel up, to be effective for him. And not a word fell from Samuel. Samuel presented everything that, the, the, that God presented to him. And he presented that to Israel. And as we move on, we get into... Ooh, too far. We get into that 
Israel was going to go into war. And it says, The word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle and pitched beside Ebenezer. And the Philistines pitched beside Apek. And the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel. And when they joined battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines. And they slew of the army of the field about 4,000 men. And when the people were come into the camp, and the elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord spitten us today before the Philistines? Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hands of our enemies. So when we read, we, we see that Samuel is now the leader. And during this time, it, the Israelites are now going to go into battle against the Philistines. And, and they, they, they pitched their tents, uh, I believe it says in the Phil, uh, Philistines, or the Israelites pitched their tents, and the Philistines pitched their tents in Apeka. And now they're, they're, they're on opposite ends and they're on opposite sides and they start going to battle and the, the Israelites and the Philistines, they meet and they go to battle and what happens? The Israelites don't get wiped out, but many men die. Many Israelites die, or die that, that day. It says 4,000 men died. And it says, and when the people come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, wherefore hath the Lord smitten us? Today. So the Lord had stopped this. The Lord did not give them the victory. So when we look back in Samuel, we talked about how, how the, the Israelites and how the Jews had, had strayed away from God at this point. They were doing things that they shouldn't have been doing. And they were not following what God wanted them to do. They were not being loyal to God at this time. So God himself let this happen. God pulled himself away and said, okay. I'm not going to save you. You're going to go to battle and you're going to lose. So, what do they say? And it says, So the people sent to Shiloh, and they might bring from this the ark of the covenant of the Lord of the host, which dwelled between the cherubims, and the two sons, Eli, the two sons of Eli, Hophen and Phinehas, were there in the ark of the covenant, with the ark of the covenant of God. So I want to kind of look at a phrase in verse 3, and it says, And when the people were coming to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, so that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hands of our enemies. So I want to look at a word, and the word is it. So when they're talking about, about going to get this ark of the covenant, the ark of the covenant is a, a golden box that was given to Moses and it was placed inside the Ten Commandments, the rod of Aaron, which bloomed, and manna, which was, was what the Jews ate when they were in the desert, what God provided for food at that time. So, between this, on top of this Ark of the Covenant, you had two cherubims with wings that came over, and you had the seat of God, the resting place of God for these Jews. So, they say, we need to fetch it. We need to fetch the Ark of the Covenant because we've been smitten by the, by the Philistines. And when we go get that Ark of the Covenant, we'll be saved. We'll be able to, to fight back and we'll defeat these Philistines. So I want you to keep that word it in mind. And it says, And when the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout, so that the earth rang again. And the Philistines heard the noise of the shout. They said, what meaneth the noise, this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood that the ark of the Lord was come unto the camp. And the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God is come unto the camp. And they said, Woe unto us, for there hath not been such a thing heretofore. Woe unto us, who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. Be strong yourselves, young men, O ye Philistines, ye be not servants unto the Hebrews, as they have been to you. Quit yourselves like men and fight. And the Philistines fought, and Israel was smitten, and they fled every man into his tent. And there was a very great slaughter, for there fell of Israel thirty thousand. 
foot in it. So when we read on from verse 5, we, we see that the Ark of the Covenant comes to Israel. And when the Ark of the Covenant comes to Israel, all the Israelites are really excited. They're thinking, oh, the, the Ark's here. We're saved. Uh, the Ark is going to save us. Now that it is present in our camp, we can't lose. So they, they yell this great shout. And it shakes the earth. And the Philistines are scared. They say, what, what is that shout? What's that noise that's coming from the Hebrew camp? That's insane. It's shaking the earth. And they got intel and said, the Ark of the Covenant of the God of Israel has come. The God of Israel has come into their camp. And they say, what well, woe is us? Because we know what this God can do. We know the power of this God. Through the stories of the Egyptians when, when, the, when God made all these plagues happen and made the Pharaoh release the Jews. We know what this God can do. Who's going to save us? Now isn't that crazy that, that even non-believers in God in this time, even people who weren't Jewish people, accepted the fact that God was an all-powerful God, was a very mighty God. They knew that. There was no denying it. They had proof all the time. Constantly through, through times that the Jews traveled and times the Jews got settled, what God did was recorded and they knew this. They had this information and even they knew the power of God. So we, we move on in our reading and it says, they were afraid, but somebody said, hey, hey guys, you hear the loud noise, I know you're scared, you know, but you need a man up. You need to man up and you need to move and we need to fight because we came here to fight these Jews. Don't let them take you into slavery. Don't let them uh, take you in like we have them. Don't be captives like they were to us. So the Philistines, they, they, they take that deep breath and they pull the big boy pants up and they run into battle. You know what happens? They win. And the Philistines fought, and the Philistines fought, and Israel was smitten, and they fled every man into his tent. And there was a very great slaughter, for there fell of Israel thirty thousand footmen. So when a story like this, you're like, oh yeah, the Ark of the Covenant, it's in the Jewish camp. These they're definitely gonna win. The Jews are definitely gonna win. These Israelites. They're gonna win. But then you you get to the end and it they didn't win. They were smitten. 30,000 footmen were slaughtered by the Philistines. They were slaughtered by the Philistines. And they all ran to their camps. And it says the ark of God was taken. And the two sons of Eli, Hophen and Phinehas, were slain. And there ran a man out of Benjamin, out of the army, and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes rent and the earth upon his head. And when he came, lo, Eli was sat upon a seat by the wayside watching for his heart trembled for the ark of God and when the man came into the city and told it and told it all the city cried out and when Eli heard the noise of the cry he said that what meaneth the noise of this tumult and the man came in hastily and told Eli what and told Eli now Eli was 98 years old and his eyes were dim and he could not see and the man said unto Eli, and I am he that came out of the army. I fled the day unto the, out of the army. And he said, What is there done, my son? And the messenger answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there hath been also a great slaughter among the people. And thy two sons also, Hophen and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God is taken. So, the Israelites run away from the Philistines. And they're all scared now. So the Philistines ended up taking the Ark of the Covenant, the resting place of God, this sacred treasure that the Jews have treasured for so long. And they've taken it. And if we, if we move forward the story, it's, it's a funny story about how, what happens to the Philistines after they take the Ark. But we, we see that they've taken this Ark and somebody runs back to Eli and they say, 
I, I've got to tell you what happened. I fled out of the army. I'm here to tell you what happened. And Eli says, what happened? And he says, the Ark of the Covenant was taken. And your two sons, they're dead. And we, when we look back into the story, it makes sense of why his two sons would, would have perished. Because it was promised to him that that was going to happen. Eli should have already expected this, actually. So Eli freaks out about the Ark being taken and his sons dying. And he, he falls back. He falls back and he busts his head open, breaks his neck, and he dies. Just like God said would happen. Everything that God said would happen comes to pass. And these Jews and everybody in Jerusalem are so freaked out that the Ark of the Covenant was now taken and this sacred treasure, this resting place of God, was now gone out of Israel and their enemy had taken it. But you know, it's funny, because they were so freaked out that this box of gold with some mana in it and a rod, a rod of Aaron, and the Ten Commandments was taken, and they were so freaked out. But what little faith did they show? They were so worried about this Ark of the Covenant, and that's why I want to look back at, at the word it. Because when they make the phrase, it will save us, they're saying that if we bring this ark, if we bring it in to the battle, it is going to save us from these Philistines. We are going to, to win against these Philistines. They didn't say the Lord will save us. They said it will save us. The ark of the covenant will save us from these Philistines. And they didn't put their faith in God. They put their faith in a relic, an old relic, that yes, it was very important at the time and was still very important to God, but it was not specifically God. It held the things that were important to the Jews, but it did not fully hold God because God is ever present. He is everywhere around us. And the Jews didn't think about this. They ignored that fact. Their God was the all-powerful God. The God who can do all things. And they were so worried about this army of the covenant getting stolen that they completely forgot the fact that God was so powerful He can take care of Himself. He doesn't need you to worry about Him. They worried so much about this relic, this treasure, that they, had, they were blind to the fact that that they were so far gone from God that he had almost pulled himself away and let them fall into their own sins. Now I want to kind of finish this up as, uh, for this lesson. So I think some of us as Christians, and I've kind of, through this coronavirus, have noticed that some people were all freaked out about not being able to be the church. And not being able to meet in the building. And what are we going to do? Let me tell you. This building that I'm standing in at the moment. This building is not. It's very important. It's very, it's very important for us to take care of what, God, what is God's. Because this is God's building. But it is not God. And it does not hold the power of God. And us meeting in this building is not what needs to happen. Us staying connected and staying together is what needs to happen. And us freaking out about not being able to publicly meet together is not what we need to be worrying about right now. What we need to be worrying about is that there's a, a, a terrible virus going around that's taking people out of work, getting people sick, killing off loved ones, and just making terrible things happen. And we need to keep in mind as a church and remember as a church that once, once this all passes, once this all goes away, we need to get back out in the community. We need to start doing God's work because God is going to give us that open door. He's going to give us those opportunities to reach people who need it. And we don't need to be like the Jews and say, well, we gotta, we got to take care of this first. we got to stay in the building. we got to make sure to meet back up. We can't lose faith. Because as a church, we need to keep that faith. And even where you are right now, even if you're locked up in your house and you're quarantined, it is still your responsibility as a Christian right now to still be trying your best to spread the Word of God in any means that you can. 
Let us not lose our faith. Let us not lose our understanding of our God and how powerful and great He is. Because God can take care of Himself. God knows what's happening. And we need to rely on that same God, that same powerful God, to get us through whatever. Lest it be the coronavirus or anything else. And we need to stay strong as a church and not lose faith and not freak out about things that we don't need to freak out about. Because God is ever-present, strong, everlasting, and whoa, crazy powerful. So put your faith in Him. Put your faith in a God that can do something.